I mainly go about my work as a reporter. So I'm not somebody who's um, you know building companies, you know creating products, um, or even really, uh, in, except when I can can't avoid it, writing academic papers about it or stuff like that. I'm really trying to find ways to tell stories and um, have found in this case that actually kind of stitching uh, some, some disparate efforts together uh, through stories has been, has been quite powerful. We're moving from an economy with a cool toy called the internet uh, to a situation where the internet is increasingly kind of acting as the infrastructure of the economy. Um, and so it matters more and more um, how this thing is structured, uh, who's in control of it, um, what it's made up of. And, and, and I think a lot of these questions, kind of weirdly, haven't been addressed as head-on as I think we're starting to realize we need to start addressing them. And, and that's kind of a scary moment because I think a lot of us are realizing that maybe we've been a bit behind, but on the other hand, um, it's a really exciting moment and I think there's some really powerful stuff coming out of the woodwork. Now, just to be clear, you know, I think there's this tendency in internet, internet culture to imagine like everything that has to do with the internet as being totally new, right? Um, and I think we, we, we have to be a little cautious about that because it actually diminishes our, our resources. This is a chart that's often called the jaws of the snake, right? Can you see the, the jaws of the snake? Um, you know, top jaw, bottom jaw, us in the middle. Um, productivity is going up. Pretty constant since World War II. Yet, hourly compensation um, started going flat um, in around, in our case, in around the 1970s. Okay, and, and this is like, you know, this is very macro, um, and there are lots of other curves that, that help us understand our economy, but it does point out that stuff like we're seeing with like the Uber drivers protesting around the world with with um, a, you know, a sense of growing precariousness um, among people engaged with the online economy, is actually, this, is, this appears to be a kind of um, ongoing process uh, that wasn't invented with the online economy, and that th these problems um, uh, date back further. And this is something that I started exploring uh, in my own reporting up close. So for instance, um, in New York City, I uh, spent a good deal of time reporting on retail workers, uh, in particular, who were seeing their schedules become more and more unpredictable, uh, more and more subject to uh, forces beyond their own control. Um, and, and in many cases, it appeared that what was happening is that, is that algorithms were um, uh, deciding when they were going to work. Um, and they were really, really optimizing this. They were finding themselves kind of beset by the power and prowess of the online economy. On the other hand, in a lot of other cases, like including that of this guy, Jedediah, who worked at Zara, the, the um, fashion retailer, um, they actually weren't using the online tools. Um, they weren't using the digital scheduling platforms, but his bosses were acting like they were. And so he was getting scheduled two hours uh, before his shifts. He had to be waiting at the bus stop um, looking at his phone uh, uh, to see whether he would be working that day um, uh, because it took him two hours to get to work from where he was living. Another um, uh, group that I and my colleagues have started working with is the Domestic Workers Alliance. This represent, is an organization that represents um, largely immigrant women who work in homes um, doing elder care, child care, cleaning, things like that. Uh, and these people, according to to U.S. labor law that date, dates back to the late uh, mid to late 1930s, um, aren't covered, aren't, aren't able to be organized under formal unions. Um, and so it's a very precarious workforce. Uh, they're seeing their labor markets radically change, right? Uh, markets that they once had much more control over through word of mouth, through recommending you know, their friends to, to, um, to their bosses. Instead, they're seeing people increasingly turn to online platforms, which they have very little control over, and which they're unable to set the, con the constants for. You know, they're unable to have any say over what the rates are. You know, they're just kind of floating in a market that's being determined um, on an app that's being programmed far, far away. Um, 
And then there's a kind of apocalypse that, that we see um, before us in the extremely ugly website of Amazon Mechanical Turk. Um, this uh, platform on which people can do entirely online piecework. There are no uh, minimum wage um, constraints on the platform whatsoever. Um, review, uh, employers can review workers, but not the other way around. So in, in, it's kind of a, a, a guidebook to um, the worst case scenario for work, for the future of work. And it exists and it's um, being offered by one of the most powerful companies in the world. But these are some of the, the people who, the experiences of those being disrupted. You know, we often hear disruption talked about this great, as this great thing, it you know, creates value for shareholders, it creates opportunities for platforms, but there are people on the receiving end of this. Meanwhile, there's this kind of embrace of the culture of sharing. Um, I think of this as kind of a, a, an outgrowth of the generation which you know, I kind of consider myself a part of, that came of age in the midst of the um, economic crisis, you know, the financial crisis of 2007, 2008. And so, you know, it's a generation of people drawn to this idea for really good reasons of, you know, sharing more of the stuff we have. Um, and, and, and this is partly a response to the precarity of the, of the, uh, the post-crisis environment, um, but it's also kind of a return, we hope, to values that we really like, community, um, uh, uh, kind of self-help, uh, sustainability. Um, you know, why have two cars when you can have one? Um, but it kind of raises the question, uh, and, and this is a question that has been playing out a bit. Interestingly, at we share the um, community that I'm just putting on display here, a European European sharing economy network. Over the past few years, where they've been kind of coming into um, uh, coming to to realize that the sharing that they've been talking about maybe wasn't really sharing all along, or it wasn't sharing quite as deeply as maybe it should be. This is not a question that often in the US our sharing economy uh, it has been asking so, so quite so readily. Um, uh, we've just kind of moved on to calling it the on-demand economy and, um, and we're happy enough with that. But um, it is a really important question. Really, in a lot of these cases, what we're talking about when we talk about sharing is micro rental, you know, and the, the the rules, the constraints, the resource of the platform is off the table as far as sharing goes. We don't share that whatsoever. We we just use it. And when such platforms are talked about as democratizing something, you know, there's no semblance of the stuff that democracy used to mean, like voting booths and town meetings and accountability and co ownership and co governance. So I think we kind of have a choice here, again, as we confront the kind of macro level. Um, on the one hand, you know, we see visions of a kind of liberated workforce in which we, um, you know, don't need to live by having these um, boring old full-time jobs that we have for our entire lives anymore. You know, we don't have to define ourselves quite so fully by the job. We can imagine ourselves as being more fully in control of our economy because no longer is the job the kind of main locus of activity, it's the platform. And the platform is a mode of connection. It's a tool for interconnection, and that's really exciting. Um, so this is a, a site of a, of a co-working uh, cooperative in New York City. You know, it could just as easily be, um, uh, be in Spiral as well, or um, you know, ma many other cases where where some really beautiful models have emerged for a kind of um, a kind of liberated freelancer, uh, uh, where people kind of reclaim control over their work. On the other side, there's um, this kind of vision of of the uh, um, of the precariat, one in which the 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 rudiments of citizenship have disappeared. The stuff that used to be part of being a citizen, you know, having a pension, a decent job, all this stuff is gone. Um, and that this kind of takes us back to the Amazon Mechanical Turk. And so th there are kind of two choices before us, and both are happening at the same time. And I think it, it, you know, these two choices require us to ask, what do we say no to? And, and what do we say yes to? Now, we've much more asked, um, especially at the level of government, the question of no, 
what do we say no to? In, in what ways do we say no to, to Airbnb and Uber, right? Um, but actually, I think the far more interesting question, especially probably for people in a room like this, is what can we say yes to? What can we build? One way of answering that question is to combine these two kind of unwieldy words that we're still trying to figure out the meaning of into uh, uh, platform cooperativism. This is a term uh, coined by my colleague at the New School in New York City, uh, Trevor Schultz, um, and kind of in dialogue with reporting I was doing about uh, the, um, the ways in which this phenomenon was, was emerging, in which we started noticing the, the rudiments of a real sharing economy. Again, this is not stuff that begins with the internet. Uh, it, the modern cooperative tradition, and this is just the modern tradition, doesn't count all the kind of guilds and monasteries and, and tribes uh, uh, that preceded, has been really well developed over the years. Um, I, I really recommend, if you haven't already, um, taking some time to look at the, the internationally recognized principles of the cooperative movement. Um, that are um, published on the International Cooperative Alliance website. Really, what it comes down to is shared ownership and shared governance. With that also is, is shared profits. With that also is a kind of commitment to the common good. Creating enterprises that have their members' interests and that of their communities baked in uh, to the ownership structure. It's not just a matter of branding, you know, it's a matter of the core of the company. This is a tradition of enterprise that is incredibly pervasive around the world. You know, in many of our cases, we, we know of just a few um, examples around us. You know, maybe in, in this country, it's you know, dairy cooperatives. Um, but, but around the world, uh, uh, co-ops are everywhere, taking all sorts of forms. In the state where I live, uh, in Colorado, 70% uh, of the state's territory gets its power from electric co-ops that were set up with government support in the 20s and 30s. Um, the credit union that I belong to is uh, uh, one of the largest mortgage lenders in the region. Um, and you know, and then on a smaller scale, in the mountains west of me, a bunch of people got together and, and created their own internet service provider that they own and govern and, and maintain themselves. Um, so these things take all shapes and sizes. Kind of strangely, this is something, this is a tradition that has kind of fallen out of our educational systems um, it's fallen out of what often um, people in positions of power see as business development, but that hasn't always been the case. Um, and uh, certainly in my country, there were periods where there was serious public investment in cooperative enterprise. Another thing to throw into this mix is something that's probably very familiar to people here, which is the tradition of commons-based peer production. You know, stuff like Wikipedia, this is not just a tool, uh, Wikipedia, but is also part of the kind of basic infrastructure of, of the internet. You know, it's relied on heavily by search engines to um, identify reliable sources. Another case is stuff like the Debian Constitution. You know, this is a governance structure for Debian, which is one of the major projects that builds on the Linux operating system, which, for instance, this computer and most of the servers running the internet uh, are running on. It's a remarkable reminder of the capacity for, for um, uh, sophisticated self-governance among distributed people, on distributed participants online. But there's been a real shortcoming in the um, in this tradition of peer-to-peer self-governance that I think the cooperative tradition speaks to really well. Again, that question of who benefits, who owns, and and um, uh, you know who reaps the the uh, uh, the value from this work um, it is often left either unanswered uh, or just kind of kicked down, uh, kicked down the line. And I think it's partly as a result of this, at least partly, that open source culture has tended to be quite exclusionary. Um, it often doesn't enable people who don't have a lot of privilege going in to participate. And this has been a real symptom of, I think, a problem that goes very much to the heart of this, of this movement. Um, uh, another expression of it is in tools like Android, right, which is the Google mobile operating system built on Linux, built on one of these peer-to-peer uh, uh, -peer, uh, tool, uh, you know, open source tools, uh, but which is also one of the most impressive and powerful tools for corporate surveillance ever invented, right? 
And so built on top of this amazing community endeavor is, a, um, is something in which the, the financial value gets captured and trapped very nicely for the company that adopts it, um, puts it to use, and, and, and monetizes it. It makes one wonder whether um, this is something the movement, the open source movement, should, should embrace. Uh, finally, the, the concept of platform cooperativism is an attempt to kind of correct for this oversight, for this, this uh, uh, lacking at, uh, attention to ownership um, combined with governance, this recognition that without shared ownership, shared governance can be kind of empty. And so in late 2015, um, you know, we published articles um, uh, kind of exploring this emerging movement. Uh, this one includes uh, quite a bit uh, uh, on Lumio. Uh, and then late 2015, we had a big event in New York City, um, also called Platform Cooperativism. More than a thousand people came, uh, 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 not just kind of like radical cooperativist activists, but um, New York City council members, um, investors, founders of major platforms like Zipcar and Meetup, uh, people who, from all, for all sorts of reasons, from all sorts of directions, are kind of feeling dissatisfied with the um, way in which the on online economy has been emerging. And we start to see added values coming in uh, into the picture. When we add this offline cooperative tradition into the online economy, Shared ownership, certainly. With that comes kind of built-in solidarity and workers' rights. And this is one reason why uh, among our major partners have often been labor unions who are interested in trying to find a different strategy not only for themselves, uh, but for uh, as a business model for themselves, but as a um, tool for their, um, for their members to gain greater empowerment. There's also stuff that I think that open source culture has to offer the cooperative movement that have been kind of left out. Um, for instance, uh, transparency, you know, a very, very high value in, in the open source movement, which cooperatives are kind of hit or miss on. Um, and this is creating new opportunities uh, around stuff like rethinking the fair trade movement, less around centralized certification and more around building in um, transparent supply chains all the way down. Um, some really interesting stuff. Also, questions about portable data. Um, you know, how can we make sure that we as individuals really maintain control over the personal data that we might offer and um, use in online services? This is a question that a lot of folks in this movement are really grappling with. These are, again, mainly questions, not so much answers. I've been trying to gather some of these emerging platforms on a, on a really simple, dumb uh, tool that we're calling the Internet of Ownership. Um, just trying to recognize the extent to which this ecosystem uh, uh, for platform cooperativism is already developing. You know, so we have uh, platforms in this, uh, stuff like Fairmundo, which is a German Amazon-like -like marketplace uh, where the vendors are the co-owners for the most part. Guerrilla Translation, which is a translation cooperative. Loganomics is a new uh, kind of task rabbit like gig platform, again, where the workers um, are co-owners. We've got Lumio in there. And Stocksy United, which is a, a stock photo website that's owned by photographers. It's doing millions of dollars in business every year. And so we're seeing a couple of things developing here. Um, and, and there are two strategies that are important to, to uh, that, that are actually the same strategies of the offline cooperative movement right now. One is about startups. You know, how do we build startups, uh, new companies that can integrate cooperative um, uh, ownership structures and values into their DNA? And then most of all, how do we make them work in the existing market? How do we create the, the tools of financing um, and uh, uh, and culture. This creates an opportunity for developing a really different kind of startup culture. You know, one um, that, that is maybe a little less dependent on um, particular kind of founders and leaders having particular kinds of relationships with particular people in power, but is much more about um, creating new markets around community needs. Another, the other strategy is conversions. 
in what cases do we need to start work with existing enterprises and convert them over to more cooperative forms? And I think this is a really important strategy and it's sometimes overlooked because of the kind of glorification of the startup um, and kind of that, that dream of creating the perfect startup from scratch. But in many cases, I think it might make more sense to recognize that a company is starting to gain some traction and starting to build shared stakeholdership and then transfer it over maybe through some kind of uh, investment vehicle that, that um, you know, pays back its original investors um, but allows uh, a broader community to, to gradually buy in uh, and, make, and, and make sure that this company kind of gets going on the right foot without exposing a broad community to the risk of early stage startups. But I think this conversion question also calls us to be a bit more ambitious because we're dealing with situations where, um, where a lot of the big platforms we rely on are really becoming public utilities and are not being recognized as such. When we don't really have a choice about whether we use Facebook you know, or Google in our, in our work, in our lives, that's not a regular company anymore. And I think we're seeing very clearly that the old industrial forms of antitrust law aren't addressing this challenge. And I think that democratic ownership is a really powerful tool that we could start thinking about as a means for addressing this, this problem of these, of these um, large, often pretty unaccountable um, companies that are increasingly dominating the online economy. You know, we also have to think, meanwhile, about competitive advantages of cooperation. Um, I've listed a few here. These are really kind of the traditional ones for the cooperative movement. Commitment and trust. You know, that was something, for instance, that I heard today um, at uh, um, Inspiral. Why the cooperative movement? Because it forms uh, the kind of commitment and trust that seems right for, for the enterprise. Federated self-organizing. This is, I think, really interesting, right? Um, for instance, I mentioned Fairmundo, which is that German marketplace like Amazon. When they're, as they're currently moving into the UK, and as they do this, they're not just making their company bigger. They're actually starting, allowing some other folks in the UK, in the offline co-op movement, to start their own version of it there. Sharing the same open source code base and federating and coordinating. Okay, so it's kind of a different growth model. You know, we can imagine this similar with, with taxi drivers, where we have individual taxi cooperatives in different places, operating by different rules, but sharing the common open app. And they each have developers that might adapt that app to their needs and contribute to the common code base. So we want to think, I think, not just about cloning some of these existing tools, but figuring out the affordances of cooperative enterprise to um, uh, uh, to actually do things better. Our partners in this so far um, uh, have started to become some of these existing co-ops, labor organizations. Um, anchor institutions are like big entities like hospitals and universities uh, that have a kind of values orientation that are community-based and can help uh, provide the funding uh, by seeding uh, uh, seeding early stage cooperatives, getting them off to a good start. Um, and then especially for locally oriented platforms, I think governments are a really important tool. From the very beginning, we've had a lot of success talking with people, with politicians about this sort of stuff, especially people who are representing poor areas, who are seeing their, um, their constituents being affected by the, by the app economy. They get very excited about the idea of their constituents, um, at least as we've seen, um, taking more control uh, over that economy and being true partners in it. I just want to offer a few, a few uh, kind of cautions that I think are important to keep in mind here. Uh, these are things that I've kind of noticed in conversations with different stakeholders and networks around the world about this stuff. One, I think it's really important to focus in on ownership and governance. Um, it's so easy to lose sight of that. Um, uh, especially, you know, online, we, we've gotten into, we've gotten so used to the idea of kind of giving stuff away, giving of ourselves, um, which can be wonderful, but I think we need to really start asking harder questions about who owns this stuff, 
who is in charge. And I was just in Melbourne before this, and we had a fabulous event uh, uh, where where um, uh, you know a group of entrepreneurs came together, and a company was thinking about converting to being a cooperative, and um, uh, everyone kind of worked together, helping them think through the challenges that they were facing. You know, not to, altogether unlike what happens in a lot of startup cultures, but I think we need to find the ways in which a cooperative culture will um, really encourage these kinds of democratic values. And then finally, I think it's really important uh, to see this vision of platform cooperativism as a horizon, not an absolute. In some cases, there's a, there's a tendency to uh, enter a kind of purism where if you're not you know, a full ICA seven-point cooperative, you know, you're not part of the team. Um, but some of the most exciting stuff that's happening right now um, in, this, in this realm is where we have some conventional companies starting to realize for their own business reasons that it makes, makes a lot of sense to start cutting their workers in. And, um, and I think we want to embrace that um, as part of this continuum. I just invite you to join. Um, I, I think right now it's really important to start building local communities uh, among entrepreneurs uh, uh, wherever we find ourselves and you know people with needs and you know whatever whatever we are um, uh, to, to start thinking about how we can build uh, the rudiments in our communities of a more democratic um, just people oriented online economy that, that the commons that these licenses have created is one in which you know, the lords can stick their hands in and take what they want. And, and for commoner movements, going back to the charter of the forest, right, you know, a big part of that was like telling the lords where they could and couldn't hunt, right, and saying what was left over for the commoners. Uh, and so, you know, I think there may be need to develop licenses that are more um, attuned to the questions of ownership and governance that we're talking about. And, and one example of that is the peer production license that the, the P2P Foundation has been promoting, um, uh, developed first by Dimitri Kleiner, um, which, which is um, a, a Creative Commons license, a non-commercial Creative Commons license, that has the added feature that if you are a, a cooperative that, that shares the value equally among the contributors, um, or democratically, or, or whatever, uh, uh, the, you know, there's specific language in there, then you can also actually um, uh, monetize the content. Um, so it's creating a commons that only particular kinds of entities can commercialize. Um, this license is theoretically very interesting, but it really hasn't been tested. And, um, and so I'm a bit wary to you know, recommend it to all until we see how this really plays out. Um, and we start to, but I definitely encourage, I think experiments with this sort of thing are, are really welcome, and we should start to think about how to incorporate um, ownership into our licenses. After all, the copyright regime is basically designed to channel creative activity into the, into the um, uh, profits of the companies that hold the copyright. Right. And so I think we need, we need to incorporate better thinking about who's really benefiting uh, as we design our licenses. You know, when you look at like the big dairy co-ops, and this is something that people complain about a lot, right? They kind of just look like big companies, right? And they don't, there's not a lot of like kumbaya, right? Um, and at a scale like that, that probably makes sense. Um, you know, one might ask the question about whether that scale makes sense, but um, uh, also I think there's some really exciting stuff happening in tech culture around how we govern companies, stuff like the kind of sociocracy, holacracy, teal um, stuff, that actually a lot of co-ops are now, offline co-ops are embracing and getting excited about. Um, so, so I think that the main answer is, is don't get stuck in that vision of the co-op as, like as, as necessarily a kind of free-for-all, right? Like for a housing co-op, it's so important that, like, that people have like long tiresome meetings sometimes, right? Because you all live together and there's just so much at stake and you all, you know, th there's value that comes from the, the relationships that emerge from that. But, you know, for, for other kinds of businesses, I think you can have 
positions of leadership, you know, of, of clear leadership and accountability. The difference is that ultimately the accountability for the company is to the people who are, you know, hopefully more its true stakeholders, rather than ultimately being accountable to to uh, furnishing profits for people who happen to have invested money in it, and who may or may not have their lives affected by it whatsoever. And so I think that difference is really the most important thing, you know. And we can figure out the models of governance along the way, depending on the context. Um, and and in a lot of cases, you know. Co-ops, you know, might have problems with, with adjudicating, you know, voice. But so do other, so do other companies. And I think actually the democratic problem is a better one to have than one than than what our default is with, with with um, the firm, which is basically feudalism, right? I would I would rather our problem be that you know we're still we're kind of struggling with our democracy than we're like, you know, going to work every day for, you know, the Lord. So there's this kind of vision of an open company, right? Um, yeah. One example of this, for instance, is Gratipay, is the, what they're trying to work toward, which is a, um, a kind of a crowdfunding thing for open source projects. And it kind of puts a, um, a, an economic layer on open source development, right? You could imagine, like, for instance, what if there were a payment layer on GitHub? Right? And people got paid for their, for their engagement with the projects, but they were still, there was still a kind of ambiguity about ownership, you didn't need to hold shares, you know, maybe the, the project is still kind of floating you know, in another world, who knows what the legal environment is. That's been appealing to a lot of people in this space. Um, I, and I think, it's, I think it's interesting, but we also live in a, in a society where ownership is the, is the law. And ultimately, even a company like that, if there's value flowing through it, somebody's got to hold, be holding that at some point, right? And um, and I think I think it is important to make sure that that question is addressed before we give up ownership, right? You know, I you know I'm I, to be honest, I'm kind of a property is that sort of person, you know, like I'm I'm not like craving more property, right? <laughs> like I'm more interested in the commons, but I I, I want to I don't want a commons that's just controlled by Google. You know, I want a commons that comes out, that emerges from a sense of parity and equity among, the, among commoners. And so I think, you know, while these questions of ownership are kind of frustrating, they're, they're also really important. And, and we see examples of this starting to emerge in, the, in like the blockchain stuff, right? I think Bitcoin is a really telling example of what happens when people try to pretend that ownership and governance can be evaded through neat algorithms, right? You end up with a situation where a bunch of, you know, a small number of unaccountable, large Bitcoin miners, nobody really knows who they are, you know, are, are controlling the system and um, the thing is being, is kind of uh, careening into, into the ground even while somehow the value keeps going. So it's, you know, I, that to me is like not a future that I'm thrilled to jump into right now. You know, on the, at the, on the other hand, that technology could be beautiful for developing, you know, really genuinely democratic practices. But, you know, we have to start by thinking about how it works in our relationships, you know, and how it can create genuine accountability rather than trying to, like, jump ship on accountability and ownership from the, from the beginning. I think that's tended to be a dangerous strategy. I think on the flexing the democratic muscles, I think that's such a great question. And, and I, on the one hand, I feel like often we really don't do that. Um, and we kind of let them go kind of loose and we lose our ability to, we forget how really democratically competent we can be. But I guess part of the reason why I, I love this work is, is the glimpses I've had of um, the way in which actually we surprise ourselves. Um, when we're given a real chance, you know, and and I actually think like the the like democratic crisis in the presidential election in the United States right now is kind of an expression of this fact that like all we feel like we have is like this stupid presidential election, and so like all of our attention and all of our and it, and it's just overkill, you know, and it's kind of it's kind of our our loss of touch with our loss of democratic touch with the institutions and time that we spend our actual lives in.
uh, that makes us like drawn to this kind of suicide mission of, of the current electoral campaign. Um, so, so in, in terms of this kind of innovation, like there are lots of cool apps coming out, right? There are, there are these like Democracy OS, the Liquid Democracy. There's, I think there's some new innovations going on, you know, but honestly, I think a lot of the, a lot of the stuff is just below the surface. You know, for me seeing this in Occupy Wall Street was really influential. You know, seeing a bunch of people kind of come out and really very quickly relearn some stuff about how to do democracy, but also allowing their 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 um, uh, their inexperience to show very quickly. So, uh, in terms of our own capacity, you know, I think we need exercise. Uh, you know, talking with with people from Mondragon, that huge uh, you know seventy thousand person worker cooperative in the Basque region. Um, you know, they say when they bring on a new executive from another company, that it, it usually takes like five years for that person <laughs> to like get the hang of having running a company where the people who work for you are your bosses. So there's a learning curve, um, but I don't think it's insurmountable. A lot of the big ones are more around um, uh, employee ownership plans rather than like true full cooperativism. Um, but for instance, one example I really like. Is, um, is, is John Lewis Partnership in the UK, um, which is a, a retail uh, chain. And um, the, the son of the founder, like 100 years ago, was like, I don't want to do things like my dad. So he um, created a trust that all of the, um, uh, uh, in, in, that holds the shares of the company, and the workers have kind of control over those shares through that trust. Right? and converted this company from being a family-owned business to being, um, to being basically a, a, a worker-owned company. And that continues to this day. I think that model could be really good, for instance, for if Mark Zuckerberg wanted to do something actually interesting with his shares, you know, he could put them into a trust like that, and it would give you know, Facebook users a, a, you know, a say over what happens you know, on, their, uh, on the platform. Um, but but you know large com companies have kind of regularly gone in, into these um, uh, uh, conversions, and we're seeing this in in the U.S. quite a bit, like in industries like in beer, you know, where craft is really important. Once the company gets to a certain size, um, they, they start to realize how important owner the, their employees are to making it work, and also the company, the families and founders kind of get tired of running it, and so. You know, they figure out a way to sell it to, to their employees, and they get a good return on it. You know, the founders get a good return. Um, so, so there are models for this, and, and there are um, in places where this is where this where there's a kind of developed cooperative sector. There's actually, you know, an investment culture. For, for there are institutions that specialize in these conversions. Um, where I am in Colorado, there's the Rocky Mountain Employee Ownership Center that helps companies through the, these conversions. Um, in, across the United States and Latin America, there's a great new organization called The Working World that um, I just visited a, a window factory that they converted into a full worker cooperative in Chicago. So um, there are some really great examples to look at that also demonstrate the diversity of ways in which, in which founders have recognized a more appro appropriate form where we're just, we, we haven't begun. And it's, and it's, I, I hope we, I, I need, I've been like trying to find people who can be partners and helping to work through this because, you know, I, I can fill this thing up with open source software all I like, but it's still, you know, made under certain conditions that have nothing to do with that, you know, type of, of production. So I think we really, really have to work to build those alliances. Maybe that's easier here. Um, uh, I, I don't know, uh, because they're a little closer to the, to the points of production, but I think it would be really interesting to see whether there can be some cooperative solidarity uh, down into the hardware. Um, and so I just have to kind of say that we're, we know that's a problem and we desperately want to figure out how to work with it and tackle it.